Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sankal Barora. I am currently a first year Hemonc Fellow at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Uh, it is my pleasure to be talking about my abstract here at uh, ASCO. So uh, the study that I'm presenting here uh, is looking at long-term follow-up of uh, using the azacitidine ruxolitinib combination in patients with myelofibrosis. So uh, it's well known that JAK inhibitors monotherapy such as ruxolitinib monotherapy is effective in myelofibrosis, particularly in reducing the spleen size and uh, patient symptom burden. However, that efficacy is limited somewhat and uh, it's unclear whether it has any disease modifying effects or does it really alter the natural disease course history in myelofibrosis. And so far, stem cell transplant has remained the only curative option in myelofibrosis. So this area has been uh, an, a heavy area for research in terms of new drugs or new combinations that can help uh, increase or enhance the efficacy with JAK inhibitors. And so in, in this period, we had this clinical trial looking at combining ruxolitinib with the hypomethylating agent azacitidine um, in patients with myelofibrosis. So this was a phase two trial conducted at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Uh, we enrolled patients more than 18 years of age who had primary or secondary myelofibrosis uh, with intermediate one, two, or high-risk disease by DIPS criteria. The primary outcome of the study was looking at response rate uh, per the IWG MRT response criteria, uh, looking at the clinical reduction in palpable spleen size below the left uh, coastal margin uh, and uh, reduction in symptom burden, uh, which was using the total symptom score per the MP and SAF uh, criteria. Uh, the other endpoints were looking at survival and adverse effects and safety data. So uh, total, we enrolled 61 patients uh, in this uh, final uh, presentation of the study and uh, the 61 patients here it's very important to know that 62 percent of this patient population was actually intermediate to or high risk disease so this was more more higher risk cohort than what we've seen in prior studies and uh, around 14 patients that is 23 percent of our cohort actually had more than five percent bone marrow blast at baseline so uh, and as you know that that uh, this particular group with higher bone marrow blast are often excluded uh, from the prior uh, Rux monotherapy trial. So we overall had a higher risk cohort um, going ahead. And so out of these 61 patients, we saw at least one IWG MRT response in about 45 patients, accounting for an overall response rate of 74%. Uh, breaking down the responses, majority of the improvements were seen, a majority of the responses were improvement in symptom burden. So the TSS 50 score, that is 50% reduction in the total symptom score um, for patients who had baseline TSS 12 or more. And that was seen in 69% of the patient population uh, by the last median follow-up, by the last follow-up. Uh, similarly, in patients whose baseline spleen size was at least 5 centimeters or more uh, below the left coastal margin, we had 61% of the patients um, having achieved 50% reduction in the spleen size. So a CI spleen of 61%. Uh, these are pretty impressive numbers given the high-risk cohort that we already have. We also had four patients achieve complete cytogenetic remission and four patients achieve partial molecular response uh, in their JAK2 allelic burden uh, in the study as well. Looking at uh, overall survival, uh, with a median follow-up of about 92 months, we had an overall survival, a median OS of 46 months with a three-year survival rate of 60%. Uh, it's interesting to know that about five patients, that is 8% of the population, did transform to AML during the study, but three out of these five patients already had bone marrow blasts more than 5% at baseline. At the end of follow-up by data cutoff period, about 14 patients, that is 23% of the population, has transformed into AML, but this is at the latest median follow-up. In terms of uh, transplantation, so 20 or 33% uh, of the patient population, that is 20 patients, were able to be bridged to allogenic stem cell transplant. And um, on a landmark analysis, we found that patients with intermediate to or high-risk disease who underwent transplant in our cohort had a trend towards improved uh, median OS, even though statistical significance was not achieved. In terms of the safety data, uh, the side effects that we saw were quite expected uh, with ruxolitinib and azacitidine individually. Um, so it was mostly hematologic side effects. The most common grade 3 to 5 uh, treatment emergent adverse effects were basically anemia and thrombocytopenia. Uh, we also had pneumonia seen in around 20% of the patient population. Most of the side effects were manageable and transient and only four patients had to be taken off of study because of severe side effects and these included anemia, thrombocytopenia and neutropenia. 
So in conclusion, uh, we would say that the azacitidine ruxolitinib combination has been shown to be effective uh, in our cohort, which included 62% patients in, with intermediate to or high risk DIPS disease and with around 23% patients having more than 5% bone marrow blast on baseline. So uh, this is the numbers that we saw in uh, total symptom burden, TSS-50 reduction and spleen size reduction are actually higher compared to those seen in Rux monotherapy trials, such as the JUMP trials or the COMFORT studies. Again, this was a single arm trial. So we technically cannot compare across uh, different studies, but if you were to look uh, at historical controls, we see a better response rate. Uh, we think that this might be a particularly good option in patients who have high risk DIPS disease or uh, increased number of blasts at baseline. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.